My name is... My name is... My name is Charles II. Sorry, I couldn't resist. It's a legal requirement for anyone under the age of 25 to listen to that when Charles II is mentioned. Anyway, so what's the Farnley Wood plot, you might be wondering? Well, it's his fantastic little 17th century story about intrigue, conspiracy and betrayal, which I couldn't wait to get my grubby little hands on. So, let's look at this part of Yorkshire's in history. Churches, battles, kings and queens, factories and big machines, castles, forts and in-betweens, the stories that I told. In 1660, Charles II was restored to the throne, but unfortunately, contrary to what the lyrics say, I love the people and the people love me, not everyone loved Charles II. At the time, there was a significant group of Protestants who rejected the Church of England or who wanted to worship outside of it. These were called dissenters or nonconformists, and they suffered a considerable amount of religious persecution. For example, between 1661 and 1665, with the Clarendon Codes, a series of laws which heavily restricted dissenter worship and basically emphasised the supremacy of Anglican worship. For example, in 1662 there was the Act of Uniformity which ruled that every single religious service in the country had to use the Church of England's Book of Common Prayer. Now obviously that upset a lot of dissenters and there was kind of a double whammy of dislike for Charles II because he was also quite sympathetic to Catholicism. So there were a lot of reasons for these dissenters to not like Charles II. To give you an idea of the scale of dissenter worship in Yorkshire, any minister who disobeyed these rules was dismissed. Yorkshire had 52 dismissals, the third highest in England. Now let me introduce you to two men. One is called Joshua Greathead, who was from Gilderson. He had served in the Parliamentarian Army in the Civil War, risen to the rank of Major, and even led 250 men to capture the Royalist Howley Hall. He was also known to be a devout dissenter and a bit of a rabble-rouser. In April 1663, he was part of a huge demonstration, a protest, at a Morley Chapel, where, along with around 200 other people, he forcibly captured and stayed in the chapel and performed non-conformist worship. Early in 1663, Greathead met with other dissenters in Harrogate to plot what would basically be an overthrow of the current religious system and a return to how things were under the rule of Oliver Cromwell. They would do this by launching a series of surprise attacks on important towns and cities in Yorkshire, places like Leeds, York and North Allerton. Now, this wasn't new or a unique type of plot. As early as 1660, there'd been an anti-restoration plot in Sowerby, and although obviously it failed, all it's really known for is that one of the members called Charles II's wife the Whore of Babylon. But anyway... Now let's introduce the second man, who is actually Greathead's cousin, Captain Thomas Oates. He too was a dissenter and had served under the parliamentarians in the Civil War. In fact, he was part of Sir Thomas Fairfax's cavalry troop at the Battle of Marston Moor. The two began plotting what would be a surprise attack on Leeds. They and their forces would meet at Farnley. Another group would meet at Topcliffe Bridge and attack North Allerton, whilst there'd be other groups in Durham and Westmoreland. The date was set, 12th of October, 1663. There they'd be, poised and ready, waiting to attack. Most of them had already served in the army. There were ex-soldiers from the Civil War who had been part of the Parliamentarian forces. In fact, most of those at Farnley had actually served in Oates' own cavalry troop. However, come 12th of October, only 29 actually turned up at Farnley, probably due to the heavy rain. Only eight turned up at Topcliffe. Naturally, they all agreed that they weren't really in the mood for a fight and decided to go home back to their villages, but unbeknownst to them, they had been betrayed by Greathead. What? You might be thinking, why would Greathead betray them? Why would he betray his own cousin and the plot which he helped to create? It doesn't make any sense, which is why this story is so great, because it's so weird. But yes, Greathead had ratted them out and betrayed them. Two days before, over a hundred rebels had already been arrested and were taken to York as prisoners, and soon almost everyone at Farnley would follow. But first, we need to talk about Greathead. We need to try to figure out why you do this mad Judas betrayal. Well, the problem is that we don't have any hard evidence either way. What we do know is that it wasn't a spur-of-the-moment decision because we have evidence that he'd been in contact with the authorities for some months. So this was a planned betrayal. Now, one theory offered is that it was due to a falling out he had with Oates regarding the timing of the attack, but 
Personally, I'm sceptical. It doesn't seem to be serious enough to warrant betraying someone over. Rather, I'm a much bigger fan of the theory which suggests that if you remember the April 1663 protest at Morley, now this wasn't just a tiny demonstration. This was a group of around 200 armed people seizing a church and staying there and holding dissenter worship. We actually have the arrest warrant which was issued for Greathead. And although we don't have any evidence to prove this, it is possible that he was offered a deal whereby if he became an informer, he wouldn't be punished. And one of the reasons I believe this is because when Great had betrayed the rebels, he was paid £100, which was a princely sum. To put it into perspective, Oates' annual worth was £300. So you're talking about paying someone a third of Oates' annual worth. To me, that suggests that he's a trusted, reliable informer who someone's built up a long relationship with. But anyway, whatever the reason he betrayed them, the fact is he did, and the people at Farnley would be arrested and brought to York as prisoners. They were taken to York where they were hung, drawn and quartered, which was the usual punishment for traitors. One of Oates' friends actually cut his own throat to escape being captured, and although three escaped to Leeds, they were recaptured and hung, drawn and quartered like the rest. Some of them had their heads stuck on the gates over York, and of course, Greathead got away scot-free because he'd betrayed them all. Oates himself, obviously, was hung, drawn and quartered. So what were the consequences of this failed rebellion? Well, one was the expansion of the Clarendon Codes. A new law was introduced whereby groups of five or more dissenters could not meet, not including family. As you'd expect, this severely restricted dissenter worship, and this was added to by the Five Mile Act, which made it law that dissenting ministers could not live within five miles of any town or city. To link back to a previous video I made, it's this type of religious persecution in the 17th century which forced many people in Yorkshire to flee and emigrate to a better life in the Americas. That's all I've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've learnt something new.